welcome today, uh, everybody, to today's webinar, uh, Supporting Children Who Have Disclosed Trauma. So my name's Dan Moss and I'm the Practice Development Manager here at Emerging Minds. Um, and for the past few months, I've been lucky enough to work with um, our esteemed panellists um, on a suite of products which really looks at um, uh, supporting practitioners like yourself uh, who are working with children who you know have experienced uh, physical or sexual trauma or um, uh, may disclose this as part of their um, process with you. But before we meet Kate and David, um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to recognise and pay respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, the traditional owners of the lands uh, that we work, play and walk on throughout this country. Uh, we acknowledge and respect the traditional connections to their land and waters, culture, spirituality, family and community for the well-being of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and their families. So today's webinar is part of a, a series of, of webinars that are facilitated in partnership between CFCA and Emerging Minds, focusing particularly on the mental health of infants and children. And so today we'll be considering how in particular self-blame and secrecy can affect children who have experienced physical or sexual trauma, meaning that children can take responsibility for their experiences uh, assuming that the trauma was their fault or that they were complicit in the trauma and how secrecy can make children feel that they can't share with you um, some of the context or the details of what happened uh, for fear of your reaction. So throughout this webinar we'll be discussing what we call the four P's of supporting children which are outlined in the new Emerging Minds course, Supporting Children Who Have Disclosed Trauma. So that's, uh, that's available on a handout um, as part of this webinar. Uh, you do need to, to register uh, if you haven't done so to Emerging Minds to be able to access that course. And we've also um, in the handout got a um, paper uh, which has some animation of um, Taj in it uh, for those of you who are interested. Um, and we're now joined by Claire as well. So welcome, Claire. Um, lovely to have you here. Claire's just been having some technical difficulties, so we're very pleased that that's that resolved. Um, uh, so anyway, the four P's. I should I should talk to you about the four P's before we um, before we begin. Um, uh, so as outlined in our course and developed by people like Claire, Kate and David, they are power, helping children to recognise the power differences between children and adults. And in the case of abuse, how adult tactics can manipulate children and accentuate their powerlessness to ensure that the abuse remains a secret. Protest, how to make sure that children's decisions um, and actions that they have made throughout their trauma uh, made visible to them throughout your process with them, particularly um, using the assumption that no child is ever a passive recipient of trauma. Uh, the third P is purpose. So in developing a clear purpose, practitioners avoid children just recounting traumatic experiences for unclear or unknown reasons. And so from a very early stage of your work with a child, you are letting them know why you want to ask particular questions and understand the context of particular events in their life. Participation is how to help children to fully participate in their engagement with you. How to make sure that um, communication skills or language for all children um, doesn't remain a barrier to them accessing the kind of support or help they need from you. So that they can overcome secrecy, they can overcome self-blame in their lives. So without further ado, the wonderful people that have helped us develop the four Ps and um, if you do access um, our uh, Supporting Children Who Disclose Trauma course, you will see all through it. Uh, Kate Headley, um, who's a speech pathologist, Kate's got a particular um, history in working with um, uh, children uh, around trauma, um, particularly those children who, who might have communication or language difficulties, and we're gonna look forward to talking to you about that later, Kate. Um, thanks for joining us. Thank you, great to be here. 
David Tully, who's um, got uh, years of experience um, working both with children um, and their parents who are affected by uh, sexual violence, but as well um, in his current role, um, works a lot with um, men uh, who are using violence and as well um, with children uh, who are affected by that fam family violence. So thanks for joining us, David. Uh, thanks, Dan, for the intro. Yeah, really look forward to this discussion. Um, you know, really good people we got together here. So great, looking forward to it. And Claire Clapdoor, who uh, you'll notice if you um, have had a look at our paper, um, co-authored a, a paper with us that looked at the experience of Taj and how we can support him and children like him um, in our practice. And Claire, as I said, has um, been um, trying to log on for the last 30 minutes and has uh, thankfully made it. So well done, Claire. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, Claire comes. Uh, Claire's the practice manager at, at Centre Care, um, uh, with a with a range of different services um, who deal with um, you know physical and sexual um, trauma for children and their families. So before we get started today, um, the paper that um, I talked about, um, uh, which Emerging Minds has developed in in collaboration with Claire, um, had within it Taj. And Taj um, is working with a practitioner um, who has become aware that um, Taj was um, sexually abused as a nine-year-old, this is a couple of years later now, um, by his uncle Craig. And in this um, particular snippet, the practitioner is working with Taj to make power differences between uncle Craig, who was a 40-year-old man, and Taj Obert. So um, we'll just play that now. I'm thinking a nine-year-old would be in year four. Is that about right? Yep. And what about Uncle Craig? I wonder if he was still learning stuff or if he knew a lot already. He knew a lot. He used to come and fix mum's computer all the time. He was pretty good with that stuff. Okay. Should we write that down? Uncle Craig knew a lot? Definitely. And how do nine-year-olds make decisions about what's right and what's wrong? How do they work out the difference? When you're nine, you still do some pretty dumb stuff. Jason is always kicking the ball inside and he never puts his chip packets away. Mum's always on at him. So annoying. Right. So should we put down still learning about right and wrong and needing help from some responsible adults? I guess so, yeah. And what about Uncle Craig and other adults? Do they need reminding? No. You should just know by then, like after you leave school and stuff. Okay. You'll have to forgive my maths, Taj, but Uncle Craig might have had about 20 years of knowing right from wrong. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Math sucks. Sure does. Okay, so that we can see there that um, many of you will be really familiar with this uh, exercise, which is looking at the differences between um, a 40 year old man um, and a young child. And so, Claire, um, you're really um, involved with us in, in developing um, some of this storyline in, in the paper. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit um, about your experience? So, if, if Taz was to come into you, um, uh, and you were working with him and noticing his feelings of self-blame or complicity, why would it be important um, to help him describe the power differences um, that existed between him and his uncle Craig? Thanks, Dan. Um, well, as some people may know and other people may not be aware, um, one of the key groomer tactics when uh, sexually abusing children is to place a lot of responsibility on the child. Um, and, and that's something that is done in order for the perpetrator to protect themselves, is to, for the child to feel like they have been complicit in the act um, and that they've been part of the decision making around that. So when we're working with children, it really is part of our um, uh, role to shift responsibility really firmly back to the perpetrator and to help children really take that responsibility off their uh, shoulders altogether. Um, 
And a part of the way that we can do that is really helping them to understand the concept of power. We don't talk explicitly about power with children often. Uh, it, it's something that children um, are very used to, adults having power in their life, whether it's school teachers, parents, uh, essentially adults in society have power and that's just something they're used to. So actually having those explicit conversations about what power looks like, how it comes about, how we earn it um, and using a really child-friendly activity like that can help uh, children make sense of the concept of power to start with and slowly ease into understanding that adults who have power also have responsibility um, and, and are therefore responsible for their actions and really shifting that um, from the child's shoulders because because that is really how they will be made to feel most of the time and always carry that around with them. I could have done something, I could have stopped it when that, we know that's just not the case. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Claire. David, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your work um, in making power over with children who have disclosed abuse. Yeah, no, thanks. And and just building upon what Claire said, I think it's it's really quite a fundamental um, skill, I think, in terms of practitioners, you know, to understand that uh, abuse occurs in what, what I'd call a social and political context. Obviously, that's not language you would use for the, a child or young person, but as a practitioner, we understand that abuse, uh, you know, even in the word itself, it is an abuse of power, which is why um, it, it, it itself has such great impacts and harms upon a child or young person's sort of life. But as a, as a society, we often obscure those power relationships and aren't, uh, I mean, even as adults, people aren't necessarily aware of the power relationships that they exist in, um, and, unless there's sort of um, something really more overt that has sort of occurs. So I think the importance is bringing that framework to the counselling approach. But I, I think as, as Claire said, and I'm sure Kate will build upon this, you know, from a language or developmental perspective, a child can only make meaning of the experience views based on their current cognitive, emotional, physical level of development. And then also adding in the layer of that social context of the information that they have to make meaning and sense of this experience. And the vast majority of times, the only information they have is, um, you know, the person who chose to you know, harm them, um, what they said about what was going on and the meaning made, and then often just little fragments of different systems that they might deal with, like Taj, you know, dealt with a, a criminal justice system, for example, who, who have fragmented meanings of that as well. So it's really important that we can help that meaning making process through understanding that social political understanding of abuse. Yeah, thanks, David. Kate, um, you know, as, as mentioned, um, you, you work often with children um, who have had communication um, and language challenges, um, and often that's been um, developed or exacerbated by experiences of trauma or abuse. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how practitioners can be aware of power in the language uh, that they use with children, and why might uh, language be so important within this context? Mm. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I think as Claire was kind of saying, in society more broadly, language and our use of language is actually one of the things that contributes to power imbalances. And so I think as helpful professionals working with children, we need to be able to reflect and ensure that we're in no way contributing to a child's sense of power imbalance because children are so susceptible to that expectation as Claire was saying that it's adults in their life who are knowledgeable and they're already expecting that power imbalance um, and I think if people do the practice package further in the animation we actually see that the perpetrator of Taj's abuse uses language to create that power imbalance. So Taj actually reflects that, you know, his uncle Craig must be really smart because he uses big words that he can't understand. So we can see how he language has contributed to that power imbalance. So we wouldn't ever want to be replicating that in our therapeutic relationship with children. And I think um, a way to do that is just to always ensure that we are giving information to children in a way that's accessible for them 
So we need to understand what their language skills are, what their communication skills are, and what they need from us. And then always taking steps, I guess, to create shared meaning and shared understanding. So if there's a concept we need to introduce that does sit outside, as David was saying, that child's knowledge or perhaps their perceptions of activities, then we can take the time to teach the meaning of that so that we've got shared understanding whenever we use that word or that concept. Hmm. Thanks, Kate. Claire, when, we, when we're talking about power, um, and we've had several questions um, already from our audience around this, what might happen for children uh, where practitioners decide not to ask questions um, uh, specifically related to trauma um, or uh, wait until a better time to ask these questions? Yeah, I was having a, a big think about this question, Dan. Um, and I, I just wanted to start with, you know, when we're talking about not having blame and shame, about clinicians not feeling that blame either um, when they might make a decision uh, not to talk to a child. Because whenever we work with children, all of us, absolutely our intention is on protecting the children at all times. And often our decision not to ask questions is because we don't want to cause further hurt to the child. And we're often afraid of causing further hurt. Um, and, and that in choosing not to question, that's what we're trying to prevent. So I'm, I'm hoping today gives everyone a little bit more confidence um, or at least knowing where to get the resources to understand that we're not going to hurt children by being safe adults, um, you know, asking questions of children. Um, I think when we know that children have been abused, whether they tell us or their parents tell us, and if we choose to not explicitly ask some questions about that or invite um, the child to talk about that if they should ever want. We can unwittingly contribute to maintaining secrecy. Uh, a lot of the grooming tactics and perpetrator tactics is very much keeping this a secret. Um, it's always about secret. It's not something we talk about. And even once parents know, family know, professionals know, because it's such a, a terrible experience for a child, because we're all driven by the intent of keeping the child ex um, protected and safe, from that experience and not wanting to constantly bring it up. Unfortunately, the result of that can be continued secrecy, continuing the taboo of this subject. Um, so, it, and continuing the shame and the burden of the child having to hold that in because they don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. They might bring it up and adults might say, oh, let's not talk about that now. We don't want to talk about that in front of this person. Wait for your counselling session. You're better to talk about it with this person. And the child can just feel a lot of rejection around that and start to internalise that. So really, if we're uncomfortable to ask direct questions, it's really important just to let the child know that it's okay to talk, just hear the child. If we do nothing else, just hear the child, thank them and acknowledging them for sharing that story with us, acknowledging the courage that it took them to share that, whatever they did share with us, and then letting them know that it's okay to talk to us in the future, or that it's okay to bring this up with grown-ups, that that is okay, and that we won't reject any future time that they might bring that story up with us. Yeah, thanks, Claire. I now want to move on um, to the second P, which is protest. Um, and uh, done lots of thinking um, with our, our three panellists and other practitioners around um, this assumption that, that children aren't um, passive recipients of trauma, that throughout that trauma that they've been making decisions and making choices, which often um, has helped keep, you know, other people, little brothers, sisters in their family safe, um, or has allowed for um, a connection to continue with mum, dad, uh, you know, and extended family members. And um, David, um, a lot of what 
you've talked about um, both today, but but also um, in uh, within the course, is that you have a real curiosity about the actions that children take um, to keep themselves safe or trauma, um, uh, or you know even making sure that the trauma gets found out by someone. I was wondering whether you, you could kind of start off by talking a bit about that. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a really important entry point of meaning making for the child about what steps they actually have done and made sense of. But but just to begin with, I think it's important to acknowledge when we think about protest or honouring, it doesn't mean that a child or young person can actually stop the abuse. It, it, when people often think that uh, something only counts as resistance or protest if it's you know it manages to stop the the, the the abuser doing what they're doing, and I think that's a incredibly high bar and a really unfair bar to understand resistance and response, particularly when we understand those power relationships that a child or young person is particularly sort of up against as well. And often, and children won't necessarily use the language as a protest, you know, it'd be more about, you know, he, he, he was being a bit tricky, so I I went into the other room, you know, that that's the sort of language that they use around fairness. And, you know, if you ever want to sort of get analysis of power with children, young people, I, I think just ask them about which teachers they like and which teachers they don't. You know, they notice those power relationships and the way teachers use sort of power um, within that sort of, you know, an education sort of context. But, you know, some of the things we obviously, thinking about is, you know, the stories that, you know, about the protest, the things they tried to do to say that they didn't agree what was happening, that they turned away or they um, refused to go on a, you know, to, you know, the Taj example, didn't want to go with the uncle anymore, things like that. Things they actually did that were resistance, like hiding, trying to tell, running away, you know, really quite active things they might have done as well. And things that showed quite you know, resilience in getting through incredibly sort of tough uh, times um, as well and, and and also we talk about connection like the, reaching out maybe to a, a really cared for teacher trying to let them know that something's wrong even being naughty in a classroom might be a way of you know what a young guy he's oh it's like I was setting off fireworks in the classroom just so they'd come and ask me you know what what the hell was going on with me you know it, almost that sort of he wasn't literally setting fireworks but that was the metaphor that he, he used as well and I, I I really remember strongly one of the first clients they were about you know um third or fourth clients when I was doing sexual abuse counselling, came in with a story of being really weak and, you know, he just let the abuser do what, he, you know, he did and just, you know, rolled over and took it. And then what, what came out about third session was that this person had actually said if he didn't let him do it, he was going to start on his younger brother, you know. And it was such a really beautiful story of resistance and courage. Um, but with this particular young person was this story of weakness and I just rolled over and took it. And what we were able to encourage through that protest was a really an ethical core of uh, incredible um, love for his younger brother, you know, as well. So that, that that's the sort of the the doors that we can open. And, and I think therefore we don't feel like we need to completely um, construct this completely damaged person from nothing and just build them up with certain skills. There is some really honourable stuff if we're willing to sort of understand and take some time to understand that protest and resistance to honour that as well. Mm. Claire, you talked a little bit about that before, about um, uh, you know being really curious about the stories um, of you know love and connection um, which stand against stories of self-blame or hopelessness. Mm. Yeah, and I, I really um, echo what David has just uh, said there around the bravery that young people show when protecting, for instance, uh, siblings from experiencing the same thing. Um, potentially there's been threats of a pet being killed, so they're protecting their pets. Unfortunately, um, stories of you know, potentially your mum will go to prison, you'll be taken away from your mum if anyone finds out, and they're protecting their mother, or they're protecting the perpetrator themselves, who in the, in the very complex that is sexual abuse from um, a, a parent or a relative is is there is feelings of love for the perpetrator and they're actually even trying to protect the perpetrator from being hurt so the strength and resilience and and love that the young person who's been abused has had is, is huge and any way we can harness that like David was talking about um, is fantastic and again like power such a complex notion for young people um, around and and hopefully Kate 
might comment on some of the words that we can use around that because again it's very complex particularly the younger the child as they progress towards mid-teenage years it becomes a little bit easier to unpack but uh, for younger children particularly under the age of 12 11 10 and even younger it's such a complicated notion understanding when people say why didn't you run away why didn't you do this to to be able to unpack that verbally it is so difficult. Mm. Yeah, Kate, maybe um, yeah, you might like to, to add to that. For children, you know, if they have language uh, difficulties or they're, they're a bit younger, those stories of protest or bravery or courage might be a little bit harder to, to bring to the fore. How do you, how do you manage that in, in the work that you do? Mm. Yeah, well, it's, it is very difficult. I think your um, yeah, that's one of the the really unfair elements in abuse perpetrated by adults against children is, you know, children are developmentally susceptible. They, you know, their vulnerability is so much greater. But I think sometimes in terms of language, Claire, I'm often working with mental health professionals, with young children where we might be looking at words like, you know, safe behaviours, unsafe behaviours, or helping people, um, you know, um, dangerous people, um, trying to find language that is maybe a bit easier to teach with examples too. So sometimes, you know, using a storybook, using a video example, and, and sometimes having to steep that learning in something that actually is very black and white to begin with, a bit more explicit. So for example, um, I've, I have worked with um, a primary school age student where just to introduce this concept of safety, we use some YouTube videos of crossing the road holding an adult's hand versus not because that was something very tangible and explicit that was in their kind of lived experiences and gave a way to introduce this concept which we were then going to broaden and use in more abstract ways but in her case she showed amazing protection of a younger sibling so we were able to start that kind of recognition with those explicit activities like you hold your sister's hand to cross the road and then broadening that explicit stuff to something a bit more abstract. I really love, David, when you're chatting about children's behaviour because so many children that I work with who may not have well-developed verbal language skills, mm. we are often needing to use their non-verbal communication and one of the ways that I'm working with families is just to bring in that you know lens of curiosity and to be proposing I guess just questions as to why a child might behave in a certain way what that could be telling us and I find that if we really view that behavior as communicative it helps people to start to I guess approach that child with more empathy and more mm. curiosity and that can then open up a conversation around what might be happening for their ch that child, what unmet needs might be there. So um, I think that's, you know, really helpful. I think we need to think about the fact that all of us find it difficult to use our words to the best of our ability when we're experiencing really strong emotions. So any ways that we can make our interactions with children more visual, visually mediated are going to be really helpful. So even the child who may not yet have the vocabulary to describe some of these examples of protest or resistance, they may be able to look at pictures of other children doing behaviours with siblings, younger siblings, and categorise those or sort them into piles, or we may be able to support their building knowledge of protest and resistance by using some picture supports as well for those conversations. Yeah, thanks, Kate. 
So just, um, uh, just acknowledging we've got about 2,200 um, people at the moment uh, who are tuned in, so that's great. Um, thank you all, and thank you all for the questions that are coming in. There's some really intelligent um, and uh, insightful questions being posted, so we'll, we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next half an hour. Um, now I want to go to participation. Um, and this is really allowing um, children to participate in a process that will give them the best chance of your sessions being useful to them, will give them the best chance of being able to add their voice um, to a process which um, shifts or has a chance of shifting the way they think about self-blame or secrecy, which um, has a chance of proposing new universes to them that um, offer new ways of thinking about themselves, which are more possible um, and provide um, more hope. So Kate, um, I want to um, hear a little bit from you. Um, and we hear Taj reference that, that talking to someone about his experience just hasn't helped before. Um, uh, and you know, we have lots of lots of children like that, don't we, that, that come into our sessions almost under supplements um, because they've been told to. Um, so how do we support children like Taj to participate um, with a practitioner again? How will he know? What what messages will Taj get which kind of tells him that actually this session might be a little bit different or this practitioner might actually offer him something which you know might be um might be useful. Mm. So I think what comes to mind for me is that straight away I want to set a tone that shows Taj that I'm really appreciative that he's let me know that he didn't find that previous engagement with a clinician helpful. Um, I think it's really important to reinforce to him that that was a really great thing, that he expressed that. And I don't want to in any way my body language or my tone of voice show any negative judgment around that. And I think it offers a great opportunity to start talking to Taj and, you know, fully engage him in some in investigation, some inquiry about the different elements of that engagement and what might have worked or not worked in that engagement. So, you know, potentially in that position, I might actually do, you know, maybe use a visual scale or some kind of continuum with Taj where we might talk about the different elements of that engagement. Um, so, for example, you know, I might list out, we might write on some post-its around you know, where he met with that clinician, um, when, what time of the day, but also introduce this concept of, you know, when he met with that clinician in regards to when the abuse had occurred. So that timeline in his life, what they talked about, the activities they did. And I think, you know, potentially by empowering Taj to give feedback on all those elements, I will hopefully be opening up a conversation with him that will help me learn a lot about Taj, what's important to him, his values, his boundaries, his priorities. But I'm also um, engaging him, I would hope, from the get-go and empowering him in what essentially becomes a co-design of how our intervention and engagement's going to start and move forward. And then you know, I'm a massive fan, like most professionals I work with, of making sure that we have regular opportunity for the participant to give feedback on how helpful they're finding a particular session, a particular activity, more broadly, a series of intervention. So if with children, again, I'm predominantly doing that. We might have a, you know, casual conversation about it, but I'm often using visuals and it just depends what, you know, what the kind of goal might be. Sometimes for kids, it might just be their level of comfort in attending the appointment that's what, what we're going to measure to begin with. And I might literally say at the start of the session, you know, you've, you've told me that you don't really like meeting new people. I know I'm a new person for you. So maybe your body is giving you some you know, feelings that make this a bit uncomfortable. And I might have some pictures of 
a body showing a lot of stress and a very relaxed body and and just get the child to rate that and then repeat that at the end of the session just so we're finding child friendly ways for that child to give us an opinion and also reflect on how helpful that appointment has been for them. Yeah. And throughout this process, Kate, um, uh, I would imagine you, you, you're sometimes or often joined by a, um, a parent or a carer. Um, how is it that you um, kind of open up ways for them to participate within the process, but also to ensure that they participate in ways which build the child's sense of themselves um, in a strength-based way? Mm. I think when when I reflect on how I manage that as a clinician personally, I think a lot of that is about being explicit with that and setting some boundaries and expectations at that initial point of engagement and referral. Because often in my experience, parents and caregivers are so keen to help a child and to minimise their distress, the child's distress, that part of that might be that they want to jump in and answer questions for the child or they want to protect the child from participating in the activity in case it causes distress. So I think actually just calling that from the get-go, introducing that concept, you know, saying to Taj and his carers, sometimes when we talk about these things, it brings up difficult memories, it brings up difficult feelings, but it's important that everyone has their turn to talk about these things or to do the activity. Um, and then modelling, I guess, those boundaries, if one or more participants kind of overstep those, I think really strengthens your therapeutic alliance then with the child because they know that you're an ally in that room in, you know, adhering to those kind of boundaries that you discussed as a group to begin with. So I would just literally say, oh, thanks, mum. Can we wait a minute? Because we talked about at the start that we're all going to take a turn and this, this turns Taj's turn or whatever it be. Yeah, thanks, Kate. And we are getting quite a few questions about um, working with children and, and their parents or, or caregivers. So, Claire, I might ask you um, a question because I know that um, you've done quite a bit of this, and, and particularly in working with, with parents or supporting parents where their child has experienced um, trauma, often, um, you know, uh, perpetrated by their partner or ex-partner. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about your process in, in supporting um, those parents? Yeah, sure, Dan. And I think this leads really nicely into the topic of purpose that you mentioned as one of the topics and how we create purpose with a child and their family around our intervention, which is, is really important. Um, so this leads very nicely into that, linking with what you said, Dan, about sessions being useful um, and, and making sessions useful. And I think sometimes, particularly as non-specialists, we fall into the trap of really focusing so much on building a fantastic rapport with everyone and creating such a safe environment for children that we can get stuck in that for four, five, six, seven sessions of, of creating this safe space. Um, and also, um, my experience is with particularly in a non-specialist field, you know, when you're not specialising in this, is the thought that, well, if I create a safe environment for the children, they will bring it up themselves. They will talk to me when they're ready to share it with me. And as we know what we've been talking about already with power is that the, the chance of a child doing that, even if you've spent six, seven, eight sessions building rapport, is that that might not happen. And it potentially could take a year of work for a child to feel comfortable to bring it up out of the blue with no one else 
with the adults in their life not taking responsibility to raise that difficult conversation. And it goes back to us as the adults taking responsibility. So leading on from what Kate was saying about working with parents, and particularly as she mentioned co-design and, and working with the parents, carers, adults in the child's life who's coming to the service around what that intervention will look like and being very clear around the purpose for that. If we look at Taj's example, he had disclosed 18 months prior to his mother, you know, uh, things played out 18 months prior and, and then there's ongoing uh, what seems to be trauma behaviours at school, in the home and his mother's seeking support and it's really important to sit with mum to, to gauge her understanding of something that's happened in the past, how much would that be coming in for Taj now and his behaviour? What's her understanding? Really understanding from her about how much is the sexual abuse ever talked about at home? Um, like Kate said, she's probably so protective of Taj. She doesn't want to bring it up at home because we don't want to feel like we're re-traumatising children. And then really doing that contracting at the very beginning, starting with adults who are bringing him into the service around, this is something I'd like to talk about. Do you think there is a good way that I could bring this up with Taj? If we talk about it in session, what do you think might happen at home? And supporting the parents to understand that there might be conversations that come up at the home. There might be a behaviour that Taj demonstrates that he's not done before and how that can be managed safely, which is about that ongoing therapeutic relationship, not just with the child, but with parents as well, or carers, sorry, whether it's at session, whether it's follow-up phone calls where you can. Um, and then being explicit, just like Kate said, it, with Taj about as well, rem focusing on why has this child been brought to counselling um, being explicit with the child about what you know. You know, mum brought you here, Taj, and she told me about um, what you experienced with Uncle Craig. And that is something I would like to talk to you about today because, and normalising it in that conversation, a lot of the children that I talk to who have um, experienced sexual abuse like you did or however you might phrase that depending on age of the child, um, it, you know, they can have troubles at home, they can have troubles at school, much like you're having. And I think it's really important that we talk about what happened with Uncle Craig. What are your thoughts on that? What do you think? Is that a conversation that you want to have with me? Is that okay to talk about today? So it's giving them the power where they can, but taking the responsibility for introducing it and about why you're introducing it. Yeah, thank you for that, Claire. And I think a really great introduction into this idea of purpose, uh, making sure that when we ask um, children questions or caregivers questions, that we're really clear about the function that that question serves so that um, uh, we're not engaging in kind of uh, like a how long is a piece of string um, uh, questioning of, of children, that there's a, there's a real understanding from us about um, uh, what, yeah, what we want from the, for um, that child and, and some new understandings that we think we can help create. David, you've been um, really useful in, in helping um, us at Emerging Minds to think about purpose uh, within um, a counselling session. Um, and lots of your experiences working with children who are affected by sexual or physical violence. So tell us a little bit about how you um, ensure a sense of purpose within your sessions with children. Yeah, I, I think in, in establishing that purpose, it, it's really important to know that if a child's coming around experience of sexual abuse or violence or bullying at school, I mean, whatever the context is, that that's not the only experience they've had of having their sort of their rights, you know, feelings or, or sense of self being disrespected by other adults and, and the context. So really setting a purpose that understands that. But uh, I think as the other um, presenters have said, that expecting a child to come in with a well-developed understanding of, I need to address my experiences of sexual abuse and these are my three particular symptoms I want you to work on and let's set some goals and, you know, um, you know, and this will take seven sessions, is, is really, again, expecting developmentally something that's not uh, available necessarily to a child, maybe an older adolescent might have some more clarity. But even as we know as a society, the, the understandings around the power context where the abuse occurs in, because obviously there's 
the age and developmental stage, there's um, language skills, there's a whole range of other things, but there's obviously that intersectional stuff that comes into this as well. I mean, in the context of Targed, he was abused by a, a man as well. So potentially Targe is making meaning you know, of that in terms of, you know, dominant context around heterosexual dominance and homophobia and what does this mean as well. So there's a whole range of things that we need to really set some really clear purpose of and that show that we're okay with having those conversations, um, that, you know, regardless of level of experience, that, you know, a, a, a good social response um, to experience abuse isn't going to make it worse. Even if someone's upset, it's not necessarily, if we're really clear about certain things, which is that those politics of abuse, which we talked about, that we're really taking a, a process where we're really honouring that child. At, um, and and, and co-design, I really like that idea, Kate, as well, that we're really being really clear about understanding the developmental context the abuse occurred in. Um, and we, we can sort of understand those beliefs or those concepts that are being learnt um, as well, because I think that idea of concept development is what we do a lot in counselling, and we wouldn't, you know, necessarily expect a child to um, initiate all those sort of conversations for us to be able to bring those in. And, I, and what I really like about the example we saw of that video earlier on, and, and some of the other aspects of courts, is that you know making those um, that developmental context, those power relationships visible, is our purpose as well. You know, I mean, a lot of my work initially in this space, well, I was explicitly named as a child sexual abuse counsellor. So in some ways, I understand that's a bit of a um, a different role than say be someone in a generalist role. But I think if, if like Claire says, if you know that information and it's been put in front of you, it's really important that in a in an age development process, we share that with that young person about our, our sort of role and purpose. Because the things I got taught really on was that it's not necessarily have to go into the actually really explicit details. Um, but, but a child, a young person may want to do that. Um, but it's we need to have some understandings. Um, you know, th three things that I got taught, which is really sort of important about the, the relational context the abuse occurred in, because that has a huge meaning of that. You know, like he might really still love his um, uncle and really appreciate aspects of what he's done, as well as being really angry about that. So that developmental context is uh, really, really important as well you know, understanding the, the developmental stage when the abuse occurred in, and like for Taj, we know, you know, it, was, it occurred over a period of about nine months when he was about nine, 10. So that, that's another important thing we can then bring to the purpose of how we make that sort of understandable as well. And I think you can do a lot of work about the experience of disclosure. You know, what, what he found helpful about disclosing, what he didn't feel unhelpful about disclosing, and, and really echoing what Kate said about, well, if he hasn't found counselling helpful, we don't need to go, oh, actually, you did find that counselling helpful, you just haven't realised yet. I mean, that's, you know, it's about exploring what they find helpful and not helpful. And if, if we have some of those elements, as I said, of, you know, uh, you know, understanding the politics of abuse, understanding the developmental context, you know, honouring, you know, um, in this language, understanding the protest and understanding, you know, the, the concepts or the beliefs they're formed about ourselves, we're in a place to do a lot of good because, you know, having worked with adult survivors as well, you realise how making meaning as close to the experience of abuse at that time is really important rather than coming working with someone who's for 20 years believed that they were really weak or stupid or should have known that you know um when un his uncle didn't take him fishing took him back to his house you know and you know that that he should have known that that was meaning abuse was going to occur you know so that that that's the thing that i think that empowers us but i think really importantly and a bit like you know in terms of doing this webinar and the training that we shouldn't as practitioners just isolate ourselves, we should be building communities of practitioner support for each other to get better at doing this stuff and checking out some of our thinking as well. David, um, as you just mentioned, you work um, and have worked with um, uh, adults who um, experience child sexual abuse and, and may not have um, disclosed that sexual abuse for quite some time, um, um, 20, 30 years at some times. Yeah. What's your sense of um, what response or what a, a different response those adults might have liked um, as children um, from professionals in their life. Yeah and I, and I think really importantly they're not expecting you know they were never expecting a you know a textbook understanding of every aspect of how trauma impacted their brain and developmental process what they're really looking you know we're looking for and, and talking to adults who did have really solid responses is that someone who believed what they said and said that these things shouldn't happen and it's not a child or a young person's responsibility 
to uh, know or understand what these things are. Because if we, if we come back to, a, I think, a quite fundamental understanding why uh, a child or young person um, can't consent to these things is, you know, we've, there's a value that we have that a child or young person developmentally, emotionally, psychologically is not at a stage where they can consent to understanding, you know, if it's sexual abuse, sexual sort of behaviour. So we really, you know, an adult who can be really clear about those issues can do incredible good for a child's life, you know, in terms of providing that social response that allows that person to sort of process that experience, seek other help, you know, disclose to a partner, maybe they're struggling with aspects of parenting because there's some echoes of abuse um, happening for them as well. So I think that's, you know, that really honouring, understanding and belief stuff is really important and that can make an incredible amount of a difference, I think. Thanks. And Dan, it's really interesting. I just met a teenager not that long ago and all I said to her, she was trying to understand her difficulties with language throughout her life. And in talking about that, I said, now, you know, when you were referred, I was given some information. So I know that you had some difficult experiences as a child. And she said to me, oh, you know that. And I said, yeah, that's part of the information. And she goes, I never know when I meet people if they know that happened in my life or not. And I get sick of trying to think whether I need to tell people or not. So even in terms of purpose, the sharing, as Claire said, of what info we know about a child and what we don't know about them is just so helpful for that young person. Yeah, thanks, Kate. And I suppose your role being a speech pathologist is, is different to, um, to Claire and, and David's. Um, but within that, establishing a purpose is still um, vitally important. Mm, I think vitally important as a generic therapeutic skill, regardless of what discipline you work in. But I think even more so in the context of working with children who've experienced trauma is we don't want to contribute to that sense of secrecy for children. And I think that if we're not 100% transparent as to the pathway of referral, why that child is meeting with us today, we can be inadvertently contributing to that sense of secrecy. And if we're not sharing with them what we already know about them, I feel like we're adding a further burden that's not fair on a child that they should be able to communicate that info to us when actually it might be our hesitancy around sharing that information that's making it harder for them really. So um, absolutely, I advocate that level of transparency around purpose more broadly for the referral. And then as David said, session by session, just to maximise every opportunity for that young person. Yeah, thanks Kate. So David, in the, in the continue, just going back to, to power for, for a second, um, in the continuation, um, of the animation with Taj and in the, the course that we've provided links to, um, the practitioner becomes interested in whose idea um, were the events that surrounded um, the sexual abuse. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, and I know this is a, an exercise that you've used in your practice, um, what is it do you think is important about establishing this context that helps children overcome self-blame? Yeah, because I think in terms of the meaning they make of that situation, they often would, uh, through the tactics of the perpetrator or societal misunderstandings around that, put, give themselves a sense of agency and choice where there was none. You know, and that's why some of those questions, who, whose idea was it that you didn't go fishing, you went back to your uncle's house? You know, who, whose idea was that you went into the bedroom and, and the door was shut? You know, who, who's, you know, was, was that something you wanted to do? Or was that something your uncle chose to do? You know, and whose feelings, whose interests, you know, was was that in? Was that was something you're wanting? Or was that about something your uncle chose to do? You know, in terms of establishing that, because then you can sort of, you know, then move eventually to hopefully a line of questioning about, you know, understanding that, you know, how the agency, their agency or their, their choices were manipulated to about well, who was responsible for actually doing the view, you know, like, you know, you wanted a, a friendship, you wanted, you know, you wanted to go fishing, you wanted all those other things, but you didn't want the abuse, 
And that was really about um, your uncle's choices and his decisions. So, you know, it's a, it's a general principle about all violence is actually, you know, for the person who was um, subjected to the abuse to actually, um, you know, see that the choice was about the person who did the harm. The, the You know, the simple metaphor I often use the idea of when you have a victim looking in a mirror, looking at themselves, well, I should have done this, I should have known, I should have stopped it, I should have, you know, um, I could have, would have, um, to actually flipping that mirror to actually question the choices and decisions. In this case, um, you know, Taj's uncle, uh, Craig, I believe, so just trying to do it from memory. Uh, um, so we, we, we had a discussion we were just remembering the uncle's name, you know, about, about what his uncle Craig did, his choices, his, what he's responsible for, as opposed to what you'd expect a, a 10 or 11 year old child to understand. And really underlined that an 11 year old child could never consent to, um, you know, that, those type of interactions. And that's why, you know, I choose to call it sexualized violence. It's a form of violence, what his uncle did. It's not a sexual relationship. But we still see that in the papers, you know. Uh, a teacher had inappropriate relationship with a, you know, 11 year old student. It's like, well, it's not inappropriate relationship, it's violence. And, you know, that's what that societal um, discourse, understandings that we're still sort of pushing against and trying to shift as well. Claire, I'm just just wondering whether you kind of had a, had a final comment around that kind of need to establish context in terms of whose idea was it. Uh, oh yeah, I, and I think that's probably one of the most important things that that we can do because it it really stems to the the feelings of shame and blame that are carried around, um, power, um, and. It, particularly because, you know, children will be children for a, a significant amount longer after they've disclosed. So for them not to feel hopeless to any other adults that might come into their life, um, you know, exerting more power for them to really have a strong understanding about that, um, I, I think is one of the, the most basic things that we can provide children. Yeah, okay, right. Um... So another question that's um, come through quite um, a lot from our audience members is this um, kind of fear or concern around evidence contamination, particularly where we're working with a child who might currently be going through a legal proceeding, particularly um, as it pertains to child sexual abuse. Um, Claire, I'm wondering um, if you might be able to um, provide uh, some, some kind of details of how you approach this in your practice. Yeah, that's a really important question. And um, the example of Taj was uh, deliberately designed to come after the police ex um, investigation uh, it, in order to us to, to really go into depth around how you can support a child. Um, if a child has recently disclosed, uh, there will be uh, child protection and police investigations happening. And at that point in time, it is important uh, to consider evidence contamination. Um, and one of the first things that uh, I would be looking to do uh, as a practitioner in that space is to communicate with the other pro uh, professionals involved. So uh, if there is a current child protection worker, get in touch with them. If um, Department of Public Prosecutions are involved, get in touch with them to see where everything is up to and um, uh, to, to give you a sense of what kind of um, counselling experience or uh, uh, other allied health professional experience you can provide the child. Um, in my practice, we have provided therapeutic uh, counselling after the disclosure and the in initial investigation while the matter is going to court. Because once the child has had that formal interview with the police, and it is different state from state, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, but once there's, it gets to a certain point, it, it can be 12 months, two years while the court process is going on. And of course, uh, you, you, you need to provide the child uh, with support and, and, and a therapeutic journey during that time. And that is okay as long as you're liaising around that. 
if it's a fresh disclosure, disclosure and child protection and police are just coming on board, it is best to hold off um, and, and wait until you have liaise with those organisations uh, before you look at uh, raising the issue with the child and doing any curious questioning. However, if the child initiates the conversation with you, just keep to the usual, thank you so much for telling me this. It is so brave of you to come forward and tell me this. Um, and, and you can talk to me about this without being uh, leading in, in any of that type of conversation. Yeah. So, Dan, it's so, just that David here, and I just, I mean, I, I really agree what Claire said. I mean, it's obviously important each state and each process has a slightly different system and, and working in with those other professionals who've got really important work to do as well. But that primacy of that therapeutic need for the child is really important. You know, one of the little catchphrases I always say is, well, a child or young person isn't a crime scene. They're a human being who's experiencing incredibly traumatic experiences and, and as Claire, I mean a, a court case might take 12 months, two years, three, it could collapse, you know, I've, you know, so it is really important that we make sure that, you know, whatever part of the system can have those conversations, it doesn't actually be, have to be us, that they are happening though, because that meaning making is still going on and, and having dealt with a child with a non-guilty uh, finding, then then that can even leave a whole meaning of, oh, well, maybe I did do it then or maybe it wasn't wrong. So just making sure that we're not treating children as crime scenes is a really important ethical part around the system as well. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Thanks, and I David. think when we talk about this conversation, one thing that comes to mind for my profession of speech pathology is just we know that complex trauma experiences do impact children's language skill development and that needs to be considered in the court process and the investigative process for children. So if people are involved with children around that time of disclosure, when the police investigation starts um, or the court process is happening, if there is an opportunity to advocate for that child to work with an intermediary um, as part of that process, that can be just one small way that we can advocate for that child's difficulties with language to be somewhat supported and mitigated to give them the best opportunity through that process. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kay and um, Claire and David. Another question which um, has come through quite a bit today and um, always actually comes through when um, people look at um, some of our emerging minds practice examples, where our practitioners are saying, yeah, this is a really great example of good practice, but the child in this example is kind of playing ball. They're, um, you know, they're answering some of your questions at, at a first kind of um, stage. Whereas what we know is that some children really don't want to be there at all and are making that kind of um, sense of unwillingness or reluctance really clear to you. How do you as practitioners um, kind of uh, ensure or enable as much as possible participation within um, that kind of um, context? Okay, I might start with you with that question. Mm. Um Sorry, did you say Claire or Kate? I got mixed I up. Sorry, Kate. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's all right. Um, I think for me, and obviously as a speech pathologist, my mind always goes to language, but I always reflect that participation actually doesn't need to be verbal. And there's many ways that we can show participation as humans and people. Um, so often for um, children that I work with where maybe I've been told that they are a reluctant participant or I've got a heads up, you know, lots of reports saying they've constantly failed to attend previous appointments or whatnot, I might try and actually have initial meeting with them that's around a doing activity more so than a talking activity. So if there is the opportunity to meet in the park and kick the soccer ball, play some frisbee, if it needs to be in a clinic, I might be setting up a mega domino run or a giant Jenga set or just something so that we have a way to participate through doing rather than saying and talking. And I guess my goal with that is I'm able to then have participation to positively reinforce and hope that that becomes a bridge then 
to increasing participation, which I might then, you know, um, scaffold in then I might still do doing based activities, but maybe it's sorting some strengths cards or maybe it's um, doing an activity where I'm now collecting information from the child, but still in a minimally verbal kind of way and more still doing as we build, I guess, hopefully some positive feelings around participation and some positive engagement that may then lead to something we can build on for participation. How about for you, Claire? Uh, yes, I definitely agree with Kate um, that moving out of uh, verbal uh, work and, and um, making together, creating together, doing together is such a joy, joiner. And earlier in the webinar, I mentioned as adults taking responsibility to raise the topic, but then checking in with the child around if that is then being child led from there taking the responsibility to raise it put it on the table open it up and give the child permission but if they don't want to go there and, and that's not something they really want to talk about at that time then being led by that um, and and maybe going where you need and then maybe it does come back to spending more time relationship building uh, um, as long as you are bringing the purpose in at the beginning of all your encounters and laying that permission out, um, and then that allows you to go and be and be child led from that stage. But I, yeah, I love the doing and the making and moving out of the the um, you know the the you know front cortex and and you know area. David, have you have you got something uh, you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's there's just a really practical line about what when a young person or child can engage or not, you know. And, and sometimes we also need to think slightly broadly in terms of not being completely focused on what we're doing, being within the four walls. So can we work with the the natural support system of a child or a young person to support their parents or their caregiver or their guardian or, or other people around that child? You know, like it, you know, because that might be part of um, where that child, young person is. You know, like I I, I don't want to, but I really get you know some good support from my my mother of course so there might be some ways we can actually work with um you know those natural ecosystems that you know and and supporting them with that information because it's about concept development you know like there's not the only way counseling therapy is not the only way you can do some of these tasks you know you can help these concepts outside of the therapy room as well so yeah, that just add another angle to that. I think it's always that important to work with, you know, and they might be out of, you know, if they've got a good understanding of some of these issues, you can support caregivers or parents can actually then, you know, um, in a more naturally sort of way. Because I used to work as a youth worker. So I used to have a lot of conversations with young men driving cars and things like that. No eye contact, but they would tell me these amazing <laughs> things. Sit in a room, look at them. No, nah. <laughs> you know, so it's just being aware that there's yeah, some different contexts can sometimes help as well. Mm -hmm. And I think also like we talked a bit earlier in the webinar about co-design. So yeah. many young people I work with have never felt a sense of empowerment in how they work with the professionals mm. in their life. So if there's opportunity to co-design what that engagement's going to look like, where, when, how, what, sometimes that in itself is incredibly powerful at um, encouraging participation from someone who may appear reluctant but actually maybe they're just the product of their previous experiences with professionals. Thanks, Kate. Um, another question which is coming through quite consistently from, uh, from people, from participants, is this idea of kind of um, supporting yourself or being kind to yourself um, within uh, this work. Um, David, um, I'm wondering if you've got some kind of thoughts on, on self-care in, in uh, work around trauma. Yeah, so for the, the first thing I always bring to when I'm thinking about, you know, um, you know, self-care, care of the self, is this idea that, you know, um, going back to that social political, you know, like we were working in an area where, uh, you know, people experience a high level of oppression, injustice, unfairness, that systems that actually often make it worse, not better for children and young people. So that that is the context we're working in and always reminding myself of that. It's not just about this individual client and how I bring that sort of, um, 
activist sense around those issues to my work. It's part of me around my well-being and, and constantly naming that and working through. I think the other bit then, more at a personal level, is, is you'll be moved by this work. If you're not being moved by this work, you're not doing this work, if that makes sense. You know, the story I spoke about uh, in the set where, you know, that young boy who started with the story of I just took it and even, you know, I let my, you know, I think it was actually his uncle do these things to me and it shifted to the fact because his uncle threatened to start abusing his younger brother. Uh, you know, that was years ago. And, and when I recount that story, I can still really get a sense of that vibrancy of that person's courage and sacrifice. So you're going to be moved that way and you're going to be moved in ways also that are going to bring out hurt and outrage and injustice as well. So it's being aware of all those sort of experiences. But the importance for me, going back to that responsibility, that that my emotional response is really important that I manage that, you know, that it doesn't get in front of where a child or young person or a parent or any client is, um, that I need to develop a sort of support, you know, um, solidarity teams, teams of support I have as a professional to sort of manage that as well. And uh, just just one thing I think it's interesting if people are interested in this area, one thing I was just checking out recently is um, a woman by the name of Vicky Reynolds does a lot of work around support for, um, you know, workers working around trauma and social injustice. And she's got this little um, video and a, a workbook around what she calls the zone of fabulous. And I think it's a really good one to check out um, in terms of really thinking about that balance between getting really enmeshed and becoming heroic in this work and all uh, becoming very numb and just you know very not not engaged in it so I think that one's worth checking out as well. How about for you Claire? Um, yes really echoing David and, and Vicky Reynolds is fabulous so if anyone has a chance to jump on her website and look at her stuff I, I totally agree with David on that. Um, I, I think it, what David talks about in terms of being aware, um, there's vicarious trauma there, and there's systems burnout, and and they're and they're two different elements. And I think sometimes we we don't understand maybe the difference between those two. And in my own experiences, both of systems burnout and vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. It helped so much to go to a really good training session on that. It was actually through the 1800 Respect um, organisation, and I don't know if they still run it, but for me, that the one day training was really quite um, changing for me in a way, being able to recognise ah, this is vicarious trauma versus ah, this is a systems burnout issue that I'm experiencing because I found that being able to identify the difference meant I could put different strategies in for each of those things, which was really quite important for me. And now being a supervisor, um, I make it sort of a, a mandatory um, agenda item in my supervisees when they come. So as supervisees, we also have a responsibility of putting that out on our agenda every time we get supervision and, and hopefully we do, or potentially if, if we're not fortunate maybe seeking that out ourselves, whether it might be through our EAP service um, and, and really just putting it up there and checking in on it all the time because it can be a slow creep and it can catch up on us at some point without us realising the, the slow creep that it's had. Uh, so it is something that the more knowledge I get, I, I find the more I feel like I have some control over that and can do for, more for myself in that space. And then also realising what I don't have control over and how to manage that. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. How about for you, Kate? Yeah, well, I've been on quite a learning curve with this because I think for disciplines like speech pathology, and I'd encourage, you know, any of the viewers who aren't in like a traditional mental health position to recognise that, you know, we don't actually get a lot of this as our um, support around this as our core training, our core undergraduate qualifications. And yet the nature of our work means we are having very frequent contact with children who've experienced trauma or adults who experience trauma as a child. Um, and so I guess, you know, I'd kind of speak on behalf of those professions to reflect how for me, like Claire's mentioned, accessing training courses was really important, A, for my skills in working with clients and their families, but actually for my own self-care, to understand what my emotional responses were, 
how I could, you know, put strategies in place that would give me longevity in this work um, rather than feeling distress and carrying that distress. And I think probably the most important thing for me has been finding a community of practice who's doing this type of work in my profession. And for some professions outside of the traditional mental health professions, that's not always easy to find, but they do exist. And going through your professional peak body, looking online on social media channels, they can be pathways to find other people in your profession doing that type of work. And you can create that kind of informal support network for yourself with that. Thank you, Kate. And once again, thank you to our panellists. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree that they've done a, an amazing job today of answering um, so many of your uh, wonderful questions. So um, thank you, everybody, and it's um, goodbye for now. Thanks, Dan.